Hi, I'm Angus McKenzie, Editor-in-Chief of Motor Trend. What do the 14 vehicles behind me all have in common? They're contenders for Motor Trend's 2010 Sport Utility of the Year. Now, a sport utility vehicle used to be a truck and a tux, an off-road vehicle dressed up for suburban duty. But as you can see from this group, the sport utility vehicle has evolved into everything from a four-door sports coupe to a large luxury limousine. So how do we pick one winner from such a diverse group of contenders? That's simple. Each of the contenders is not compared against the other, but evaluated against six criteria. Engineering excellence, advancement in design, performance of intended function, efficiency, safety, and value. The contenders for this year's award are Acura ZDX, Audi Q5, Cadillac SRX, Chevrolet Equinox, GMC Terrain, Lexus RX, Lincoln MKT, Mercedes-Benz GLK, Toyota 4Runner, Subaru Outback, and Volvo XC60. Now we have a week's worth of testing before one of these vehicles is named Motor Trend's 2010 Sport Utility of the Year. So let's get started. The evaluation process begins at the test track where each contender is put through the full range of Motor Trend performance tests. These include 0 to 60 mile per hour and standing quarter mile acceleration runs and braking tests from 60 miles per hour to standstill. Each contender's basic road holding capability is determined via our lateral acceleration test, while Motor Trend's unique figure eight test provides insight into a vehicle's behavior as it transitions from braking to cornering to acceleration, as happens during everyday driving. Well, the next phase of our testing has brought us to Southern California's wine country and a 30 mile road loop through the rolling hills. It includes two lane blacktop, a bit of freeway and some country towns. And what we're looking for is how the vehicles perform under real world driving conditions. The mixtures of roads and road surfaces give us the chance to evaluate things such as ride and handling, as well as noise, vibration and harshness. This stretch of our California road loop is actually a couple of miles of unpaved track through the hills. Most SUVs these days rarely venture off-road, but the capability of going along tracks which are not paved or maybe muddy or snowy is still an important part of the purchase consideration. So we use this section to see how well the vehicles perform on marginal surfaces. We evaluate anti-lock braking systems, traction control systems, and with the more uh, traditional sport utility vehicles, they're high and low range transfer case systems and all wheel drive systems. With all the testing and road loops completed, the judges gather to discuss and debate how each contender has performed against the six criteria. And after I drove it, I really became a convert because in so many ways, it really seems to be creating a new niche of its own where, uh, as you say, an empty nester can now have an all weather, all terrain vehicle that really looks cool and uh, drives like a rally car, as we were talking about before. Really something special and unique. I'm really digging it. That it's clearly a vehicle where, you know, function follows form, like, you know, considerably. It is very tight in the back, you know, it's, it's better than the X6, but in terms of practicality, I mean, I can't look at this car and say, well, this is something that I would get. I noticed, uh, you know, back to back on our drive loop, it was effortless to drive this one quick. It's so well planted, even over the really rough pavement. I uh, love the paddle shifters. Works the engine beautifully. Really strong motor too. And uh, inside, you know, the way Audi does those interiors and the MMI interface is just so good. Beautiful place to spend time. Uh, so I remain pretty impressed by the uh, Q5. So for me, the big problem here is that it doesn't really stand out from even its own, you know, competitive set. It's very nice to drive. It's very good looking. But is it that much better than everything else that's out there? I, mean, I don't know. From an engineering point of view, it just doesn't seem to be there. This thing's supposed to have 300 horsepower. Uh, they must be Shetland ponies because it certainly doesn't feel like that. It's very, very heavy for the size. The interior package is not as roomy as a Chevy Equinox, which is roughly the same size vehicle. So uh, this thing, it just it misses, to me, misses the mark in so many areas. This thing has 
this new cool circular you know display in the in the, one of the gauges but then next to it is are these is this you know really cheese ball old school uh, gear selector indicator which looks like it's from you know like a first gen digital watch and the turn signals are these plastic crystals i mean against the competition that's here again the audi the the bands i mean the all of these touches are just it's a level below it's kind of low rent for you know for what a cadillac i think should be one of the things I found though on the drive is on the smooth pavement, this thing felt very nice, composed, poised. As soon as it hit broken pavement and you were trying to go through the turns, it just, the whole car felt unsettled. Everything felt like it was kind of bouncing on top of whatever you were going over. I, mean, I think this is possibly the best Volvo product currently out there. But it's a very high riding vehicle. It has a pretty good ground clearance, yet you don't really feel that on the road. You know, it corners nicely. Yeah. Uh, there's certainly enough power. I thought it rode very well. Uh, I think it's a very comfortable car for most people in typical driving. The ride was also quite good given its length, so it wasn't very choppy, you'd expect that. I didn't uh, sense it at all. The seats are rather hard, that's a characteristic of Mercedes, but they are hard. Um, but I, I actually like the car. It does have a nice motor, pretty good chassis, but it's small, uh, maybe one of the smallest in this class inside and awfully lacking in features. For $45,000, it doesn't even have a nav system. I kind of like the way it looks, but I'm kind of disappointed in the amount of content it has and its functionality. That was my overall opinion. I also like that it's a big car, <clears throat> where Cadillac is chasing after smaller cars and after BMW and Mercedes and things like that. This thing just says, I'm a big American luxury car, and the heck with the rest of you people. And I think that's cool. I, I, I'm rather fond of that. Why do you have to do a Lincoln that is remotely like a station wagon or an SUV? That's nothing to do with Lincoln DNA to start with. And then do one that has this large body, but a worthless third row. It, it, it's almost like it, this is the answer to a question nobody asked. I was very pleasantly surprised driving it. Um, you know, I like the six cylinder all wheel drive. Obviously that's the full Monte version, but you could get it with just about all the options on it for low to mid 30s. And you get a vehicle that not only drives really well, but it's just, as you said, huge inside. It's a little, it's a little chintzy inside. It's very clear to me who they were pursuing in interior styling. I mean, it's, it's as button crazy on the center stack as the Hondas are these days. All those buttons lined up with that, that nav screen. And uh, I think just overall execution, I, d I disagree that it's, it's classy in every aspect. I think it certainly has a size and the fuel economy, but in terms of a place you'd really want to spend a lot of time, I think there's others in the, in the segment that I'd, I'd rather be behind the wheel of. I think, I think it, this one is another one that really hits the mark in terms of performance of intended function. It's meant to be an off-road vehicle, so, you know, it, it might have felt like helming a drunken water buffalo through some of the corners, but for that sort of vehicle and this sort of tire, I thought it was pretty tidy and it's reasonably economical and it was one of the quieter ones here in terms of the NVH suppression on the tyre and the suspension. But there's a lot of really cartoony Tonka truck you know, uh, details to it, these huge headlights, the ridiculously sized Forerunner badge on the back and inside all these knobs, I mean I know they're making stuff so you can, you know, if you have your snowboard gloves on you can turn the stuff on but it's getting a little crazy in there, I mean this, the things are really huge. There's a lot of honesty about this vehicle. It's not trying to be something else. It's a car-based wagon with SUV type ground clearance and you know driving out on the loop there it was one of the nicer rides because the suspension was compliant, uh, the engine had plenty of power, you know, the steering was good. This just seems like this will be an honest all-round family vehicle. You know you can take your kids on vacation, you've got room in the back. It, it's one of the best drives, and it might be my favorite because I really think it's a car and not an SUV. I think the, the styling is a retrograde step. I think if you look at the last model, it was much cleaner. This one's got the big smiley face. It works worse as the sedan versus the Outback, but uh, it is a step back. I found the ride um, to be way too stiff. It's got a lot of really sharp vertical motion, particularly over large bumps like that and I thought that's not quite what the RX customer is going to be expecting. I thought they've tried to make it sporty yeah. and all they've done is make it stiff and it, it doesn't sit with the Lexus DNA. This is supposed to be a luxury brand not a sports car brand. And really these things are so they're so stuffed with technology I mean you, there's no 
you're arguing that this really has class leading everything all the goodies it's squishy when you get in the leather's nice i mean it really costs it to you around but it doesn't excite me at all it's it's really i think it's kind of for the guy who buys the he, the biggest flat screen tv and the nicest stereo components but then really is is watching like just the lamest movies that are you know non-blu-ray <laughs> You know, I agree with Ed's comment earlier that the center stack has gone all Honda. It's way too many buttons. It's very confusing. But generally, you know, smooth, good driving. Both engines are, are reasonable. The four-cylinder works harder, obviously. But um, I like driving it. And I think a lot of buyers are going to appreciate the size-price ratio. I, I do like the way both of these drive. I do think, in spite of its huge truck look and the, the face and these big fenders, it is really more butch. Than, uh, than that Equinox. There's a lot of femininity to the face in that, and, and particularly in some of the interior styling that is, is absent in this one, again, with the red touches and the real dark, um, sporty you know, cloth. Um, so that would be the only reason I would get it and just rip off maybe this lower valence portion so it doesn't have quite the double chin. One judge, one vote. And with all the votes counted, it's time to reveal the winner. It does. Okay, we have a winner and by a fairly commanding margin. It is the Subaru Outback. A number of this year's contenders offered bold designs or eco-friendly powertrains, but the Outback's unique combination of comfort, efficiency, versatility and value made it a clear winner. The Outback reshapes the definition of a sport utility vehicle by melding the driving refinement, great gas mileage and easy access of a car-based wagon with the multi-mission prowess of conventional SUVs. While many modern truck-based SUVs now strive to be as car-like as possible, the Outback starts with many of the car-like attributes customers want and overlays them with all-weather, all-road ability that equals or betters many of its rivals. Careful attention to detail in the design and engineering of the Outback has delivered tangible customer benefits. This is a roomy, capable, functional vehicle that is easy to drive and economical to run.